is something I, I really uh, don't want to have to receive. Uh, but it's something that uh, I desperately need. And um, we've been delving into a question over the past few weeks, together as a church family, asking the question, well, what is it that Father God is looking for from me? Uh, how would I live in such a way as to be responsive to his expectations? And so we've been dipping into significant, uh, well-known passages of Scripture um, that, that begin to help us understand, and we're trying to build a composite by looking at various places in the, in, in the Scriptures on the question. And we began with the very early church, Acts chapter 2, and, and looked at, at the fact that they, as they gathered, began to gather, they devoted themselves to a number of things. And we began to pay attention to what, what was it that priority, was priority for them as uh, an emerging church family. Uh, and then we, just, we backed up in a, in a historical timeline just a little bit, like just two or three years, to, to listen to the words of Jesus. Because there were multiple times when Jesus spoke about the Father's expectations. And, and, and multiple times in the Gospels, he would be posed with the question, well, what's the greatest commandment? Um, and, and, and he would point back to Deuteronomy chapter uh, 6 and say, look, it, 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 love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. The second is like unto it, love your neighbor as yourself. And we looked at the one example in particular where, where out of this kind of environment, this kind of answer, uh, the, the, the guy wanted to justify himself. He says, well, love your neighbor as yourself, so who's my neighbor? And, and what results is the parable of the Good Samaritan. And, and, and it's this parable that you're probably familiar with, where this, this guy was going along a narrow, twisty, dangerous, notorious road, and was attacked by bandits, left for dead, and, and then others come along, and the answer to the who's my neighbor question was the one who was actually willing to care for the one who was in need. And a scandalous story, because, you know, in the storytelling of the day, it was just like the last person you would have expected to be commended. Um, uh, in, 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 that, in that environment. And then last Sunday we backed up our historical timeline even further to, uh, to look into the Old Testament prophets uh, because multiple times in the voice of the prophets that they spoke on behalf of God, they brought correction to the nation of Israel for not attending to the expectations of God. And, and, and in a particular uh, We've looked at the language that the Old Testament prophet Micah used in this matter. And so the context being about 960 BC, the temple was completed under Solomon's care. And it was this extraordinary era in Israel's history when they had this new, sparkling, spectacular, stunning worship space. And and then it all went downhill from there. God showed up in the dedication. It was, it was a profound experience. And this all went downhill from there. We scratch our head and say, what happened? Like, what happened in ancient Israel? Why, why would they, how would they start so well? And, and then end so poorly. And that's where, where we're about 200 years later, roughly 700 BC. Um, Micah puts a fine point on it for all who would be willing to listen. A summary of the expectations that God had, they were failing to meet, and God was calling them to correct. So, uh, stand with me if you will. We'll give our full attention to, to God's Word this morning. Uh, I'm going to read the same passage that I read last Sunday, but I'm going to start a little bit earlier. And I'm going to read it in a less common to you, at least a, a, a less um, familiar uh, uh, translation. Uh, sometimes there's value in hearing it just in a little different way than what we become familiar with. So this is the Common English Bible, and just a lot of the differences to come out. And then let me set it up in this way. I've added a little bit of text. I think I've got it on the screen. Because there are different voices that speak in this. Um, you hear the prophet's call as kind of a, let the court come to session. That, that, that's kind of the first segment, he calls the hills to, to be witness. And, and then God steps in as kind of the crown attorney to bring uh, an accusation against the people. And the people respond. And, and it's kind of hard to tell for sure uh, whether they're just being defensive or, or whether, they're actually, um, whether they're actually being sarcastic in their response. <laughs> God, you just expect too much. Uh, and it's kind of in that environment that we get to the real nub of the, of the text, uh, verse 8, when, 
when the prophet almost like a defense attorney says, uh, you need to chill out, man. Like, you're blowing your case here uh, because he's actually told you what he expects. Okay, so kind of with that little framework there, um, uh, this is the word of the Lord. Here's the prophet's call. Hear what the Lord is saying. Arise, lay out the lawsuit before the mountains. Let the hills hear your voice. Hear, mountains, the lawsuit of the Lord. Hear, eternal foundations of the earth. The Lord has a lawsuit against his people. With Israel, he will argue. And then God steps in to speak. My people, what did I ever do to you? How have I wearied you? Answer me. I brought you up out of the land of Egypt. I redeemed you from the house of slavery. I sent Moses, Aaron, and Miriam before you. My people remember what Moab's king, Balak, had planned, and how Balaam, your son, answered him. Remember everything from Shittim to Gilgal, that you might learn to recognize the righteous acts of the Lord. So he's recounting the incidents of Israel's history as they moved out of captivity in Egypt and moved toward the promised land. That's, he's just referencing things that they would remember. And so the people, the people ask, with what should I approach the Lord and bow down before God on high? Should I not come before him with entirely burned offerings with your old calves? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with many torrents of oil? Should I give my oldest child for my crime, the fruit of my body, for the sin of my spirit? And here's the aside from the prophet says, he's told you, human one, what is good and what the Lord requires from you to do justice, embrace faithful love, and walk humbly with your God. Here's that last verse, perhaps a little more familiar translation, NIV. He has shown you, O mortal, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you? To act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. This is the word of the Lord. May you always understand it and live it uh, in our lives. May you see it. Sometimes, sometimes I meet the expectations of the people around me. Uh, I suspect that's true for you. Uh, sometimes you are able, you're successful in meeting expectations, um, and then other times not. Uh, other times we, we, we miss it. Um, a year ago, we had begun building this. The, the excavation was being done, the foundation was being poured. Um, uh, we, we, we had a bunch of questions, and we really didn't know for sure what to expect. So for instance, um, we, we didn't know for sure when we would be required to vacate our old worship space, our old sanctuary, and begin worshiping elsewhere. You know, kind of working up through, and maybe it's going to be December 1st, and no, maybe it could be middle of December, but kind of begged and pleaded and said, let, let, like, let us at least do Christmas Eve in our old sanctuary before we have to relocate. And, and that ended up working out really well. And, and so Christmas Eve, we had our final services in our, in our old sanctuary. Um, and, and, and what... We didn't know for sure how long we could run midweek program in uh, in the building, uh, and, and and so there's some questions around that. So what, what the result of were kind of plan A and then plan B and then contingency plan C and D were that were often the ones we ultimately ended up turning to as we made our way. We didn't know what to expect. Like we couldn't we couldn't nail it down for sure until we got there. Um, I, I remember that once once the, the walls were enclosed and the seal, the roof was on. Um, we, one Sunday, after we had been uh, worshiping at Edison School next door, we, a bunch of us came in and to pray through uh, this, this space. Uh, to, we wanted to see it, you know, but, but we wanted to pray through it. The studs were open, the drywall had been on, and, and many of you, you know, took sharpened markers and you wrote a prayer, you know, in the walls before they got closed in. You, you wrote a passage of scripture wall, something that was on your heart for our church family, and you put it there. There, there was there were prayers for, for yourself, maybe, for your family, for someone you know that needs Jesus. You, there were prayers for our community. Um, some of us put the names of individuals that we've been praying for. And, 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 and then we enclosed that in the walls afterwards, um, just trusting that they would be a witness before the Lord of something that's been on our hearts concerning, concerning our community, concerning our call. Well, it was a wonderful experience, but I remember um, there was one person that came in whose expectations weren't met. Um, and uh, they, they approached me, and, and something that had been said, they believed to be to mean that they would sit here and then look out through windows here that would, you'd see the mountains. Um, 
And now, if through the south windows here on a clear day, uh, you can see the mountains. But it was something that was said that just was misunderstood. Um, and, and we form expectations. And, and sometimes we hear someone say something and we think, well, this is what they mean. Um, other times we form expectations not based on anything that's been said. We just know, right? Like everybody thinks this way. Like only, only a fool would, would, would do it that way or would think that way. or what we, we, In fact, uh, you probably are, are, are not fully aware of all of the expectations that make up your worldview um, until someone doesn't meet it. Right? You know, I mean, it, maybe it's with your spouse. And, and things go unsaid, and, and irritations accumulate, and it's like, well, but why are you not just doing this? I didn't know that was your expectation. You know, maybe it's with a boss. Maybe it's with a neighbor. Uh, maybe it's with your children, or your parents, well, whatever your life circumstance is. None of us are immune to this. We, we kind of bring our expectations to the table of what we think ought to happen. And then let me say this, that some of you are beating yourselves up constantly, trying to meet expectations that are just not a thing. Like, like give yourself a break. And, and then there may be others who, uh, this morning the Holy Spirit is going to prompt you. He's going to say, look, you're not paying attention to something that you need to be paying, paying attention to. I, I need you to have eyes to see what I'm calling you to. I need you to have ears that will hear what I'm saying to you in order that you, you, you would thrive as I long for you to thrive. Uh, meeting any expectations. Maybe there are temporal expectations of people around you. Maybe there are, there are actually expectations that God has of us. And, and, and in all of that, let me say we've kind of done this little journey where we've been looking at this question of expectations. You know, what were the expectations of the early church? Acts chapter 2. Uh, what were the expectations of Jesus? <coughs> Pardon me. And it spelled out for us in the Gospels. He told this parable. Uh, what were the expectations that the prophet was articulating 700 BC or so uh, when he was articulating them? And, and then we also need to clarify that the behaviors that are being coached here will not save you. Like you can't behave yourself into the good graces of God. These are behaviors that, that, that we long to come out of a heart that has already been saved. Like once we've encountered Jesus and he's begun to re recreate us, renew us, now we begin to live differently coming out of that. And so we come to the prophet Micah, uh, chapter 6, verse 8, and he said, look, act justly, do justice. Uh, this was one of the, the, the complaints that God was bringing. We looked at the word justice last Sunday. We observed that the justice was against the oppressors, and, and justice was for the oppressed, for the marginalized. And then I think particularly scandalous to me uh, is that justice is central to the good news. It's central to the gospel. Um, Jesus came bringing the kingdom of God to, to humanity. And when God comes and rules, uh, when he begins to reign, those who are abusers are, are, begin to feel judgment. And then those who are oppressed uh, should begin to experience uh, a release, a rel relief uh, of their marginalization. And so we, we ask some questions of ourselves to say, well, are, are we watching for ways that, that we can bring the marginalized in, that we can, can draw in those in need? Uh, and and are, we, are we for the oppressed? <coughs> Call and pray for our nation, uh, for our world. We look, you know, it's not difficult to find places where oppression is horrific. We say, well, how can we how can we, as followers of Jesus, begin to live in a way that brings relief in our world? The parable of the Good Samaritan kind of answers that question. Well, am I really responsible? You know, who is my neighbor? And, and the answer that comes out of that text is, it, it's the need that's right in front of you. It's the person that you're about to step over who is in need. As you make your way on the twisting paths of life, God can call us to be attentive 
to what we find. It's one of the reasons why I've been so grateful of these last few weeks for our life groups who have stepped in when there's been need among us, when there have been people who were hurting and needed help, needed hope. And, and then I got an email this week um, from someone who had attended with us and felt ignored and unwelcome. And I was like, holy smokes, how did that happen? Like, we've so often celebrated the opposite because you're such a warm and friendly people. And it's a good reminder, it's a timely reminder, I would suggest. Man, we can't take that for granted. You know, that, to you know, open the circle to invite the, you know, the person that we don't recognize in. You know, to, to bridge some introductions. Have you met? The, I, here's my name. You know, and, and we begin to extend kind of mercy, extend welcome to those who come. We don't know, never know the story. Never know the story for sure until we begin to get to know those that we're with. And, and so then we come back to this. So we've looked at the word justice, but we come to the word mercy and we say, well, what is it that I'm being called to love here? Because in the context of, of Micah chapter 6, God came bringing this accusation uh, against, uh, against his covenant people, Israel. Um, accusing them, calling all of nature to come as the jury uh, in this cosmic trial. And God's saying, look, you've done me wrong. You're not, you're not actually attending to me. And Micah is sort of this defending counsel. He advises me, he says, look, he's told you, he's shown you what he expects to justly. Love, mercy. So, so what's up with this word, with this word mercy? I, I, I've wondered whether or not there's kind of a semantic connection to justice and mercy. Like, are they synonyms for one another? Like, two words that basically mean the same thing? Because uh, they kind of, at first shot, you'd think maybe justice, mercy, Passions. Is the, are they not connected? And, and the answer is, well, sort of. They kind of overlap. But they really are distinct in their, in their emphasis. Uh, justice is the kind of thing that, that leans out. Um, it, it's for the oppressed. It's for the oppressed. It's against the oppressor. Uh, it's for the marginalized. Um, it, it leans out and maybe to those that we don't particularly know well. Where, where mercy leans in. Uh, mercy... Mercy becomes mercy because there's some relationship that's been established. It's, it's personal. Uh, this is, this is in, in fact, it's very personal because we're first called to show mercy to those we're most intimate with, the ones that we're closest to. And, and, and I would suggest that probably most of us find that to be the most difficult place to be merciful and compassionate. Mercy leans in, justice leans out. Um, part of the differentiation between them. Uh, justice deals with humanity's sin and guilt as we stand condemned. Whereas mercy sees humanity as miserable and needy. I'm not sure how comfortable I am with miserable and needy. <laughs> That's the, the, the label that would, would be attached to me here. Uh, I, I don't know about you. Because, because mercy... Like, I'd rather not do it. But the truth is, I'm desperate to receive it. And according to Micah, I'm required to give it. I'd rather not need it. I'm desperate to receive it. And I'm required to give it. So, so what is mercy? Uh, one definition of mercy is compassion or forgiveness shown towards someone who's within your power to punish or harm. Um, Webster's Dictionary uh, puts it this way. Mercy is compassion or forbearance shown especially to an offender or to one subject to one's own power. So are you kind of getting the nuance here? Justice is what we're, we're, we are to do. It's against the oppressor. It's for the marginalized. Mercy is compassionate treatment in that. Uh, to the one who's distressed, the one, the one who is the guilty party, uh, compassionate treatment to the one who is the victim. And God's speaking through the prophet Micah, saying, look, I want you to show mercy, but more than showing mercy, I want you to love mercy. And we say, well, well why do I need to love it? Why does that need to be kind of the, the litmus test in this? And the answer is because I need it. Uh, I, I need it from God. I need it from those who are around me as well. I say, okay, well, if, if that's what mercy is, how do I get mercy? And the reality is, before I can get mercy, I must admit that I need mercy. 
I mean, I'm, I'm miserable. Most of us would say, look, I don't, I don't actually feel needy. I don't know that miserable is the right word to attach to me. Are you sure about this? And then there are some of the others among us here who would say, man, that describes me. Like, I feel like I, the deck was, has been stacked against me my entire life. And miserable and needy apply to me. And, and, and the reality is that the label actually is appropriate for all of us. Now listen to the words of, of the Apostle John. So I need, let me break it down this way. I need, I need mercy spiritually. Okay, so uh, Apostle John, um, writing the letter of 1 John, he writes this. This is the message we heard from Jesus and now declare to you, God is light and there's no darkness in him at all. So we're lying if we say we have fellowship with God but go on living in spiritual darkness. We are not practicing the truth. But if we are living in the light, as God is in the light, then we have fellowship with each other and the blood of Jesus. His Son cleanses us from all sin. If we claim, here's the point, here's the claim, if we claim we have no sin, we're only fooling ourselves and not living in the truth. Okay, there's a spiritual neediness that's being described here. Justice declares, I have a spiritual problem. There's an offense that exists between me and God, and, and it's a, a serious problem. And John's counsel here is, look, don't deny it. Don't own it. And then listen to the advice that Jesus brings on this question through the same writer, through the Apostle John in the book of Revelation, chapter 3. Jesus is speaking through John. I know all the things you do. That you're neither hot or cold. I wish you were one or the other. But since you are like lukewarm water, neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. You say, I'm rich. I have everything I want. I don't need a thing. And you don't realize that you're wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. So I advise you to buy gold from me, gold that has been purified by fire, and then you will be rich. Also buy white garments from me, so you will not be ashamed by your nakedness. An ointment for your eyes, so you will not be able to see. I correct and discipline everyone I love. So be diligent and turn from your indifference. These were words that Jesus was speaking to the church in the city of Laodicea in Asia Minor. Uh, he had different words for different churches. You'll, if you're familiar with those first couple of chapters, three few chapters of, of the book of Revelation. <laughs> but the description of that congregation were these things. And John goes on in, in, his, in his letter, 1 John, and, and, and he says, If we claim that we have no sin, we're only fooling ourselves and not living in the truth. But if we confess our sins to him, he's faithful and just and will forgive us our sins. And to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we've not sinned, we're calling God a liar and showing that his word has no place in our hearts. And I come back and say, I'm feeling kind of needy right now. Uh, and it, it's beginning to kind of shine a light on my life that, that, that it's rather miserable in, in this context. I need, I need mercy spiritually. I, I need mercy emotionally and physically. Uh, the context of... Uh, of Micah's writing, Micah chapter 6, verse 8, uh, he says, do justly, love mercy, uh, walk humbly with God. That's a summary passage of things that have been brought to the nation of Israel's attention before this. Effectively, God was, was bringing his complaint, bringing his accusation against his covenant people, Israel, saying, look, I've given you myself. You know, I, I, I brought you out of Egypt, I cared for you, I, I have utterly loved you, and you're not giving yourself to me in return. And, and the evidence that he lists you know, throughout, the, throughout the book are actually very arresting, um, and very disturbing. I mean, you see, God's right to be worshipped exclusively and accurately were being ignored. But, but, but equally as vile, were the violations of human rights, the, the failure to do justly uh, as a nation. They were refusing to effect justice. Um, people were lining their pockets in, in order to turn uh, an ear away. There were people who were being emotionally abused. Uh, there were people who were being physically abused. And God's saying, look, there, there's no evidence of mercy being present among you. I've called you to be a people and I know. I've called you to be set apart. I've called you to be different from the world around me. Um, and, and, and evidence, 
avenues for mercy among them, but other than they like to receive mercy. In fact, what, what, what became evident was they presumed on mercy. I mean, God's merciful. Right? Like, that's his job. He's God. Um, he's going to forgive me. I, I don't need to do anything about what God is saying, right? I mean, chill out, man. Like, like, don't get so worked up and stressed about all of this. We, we don't need to be worried and stressed about all of this. And God said, like, yeah, you do. Yeah, you do. Uh, but because those who receive mercy must be those who give mercy. And, and what we begin to see is that there's a test that God will apply to our hearts time and again, time and time again. And, and it's a test of, of the of the veracity of our faith, the, the, the depth of our faith, the reality of our faith. He'll test our hearts every time we come across a need. And there's a moment of knowing where we say, oh my goodness, nobody else knows, nobody else knows. But my heart has just been tested. Am I willing to be merciful? And so we can say, well, if that's what mercy is, and that's how I receive mercy, how, how do I give mercy? And if I'm being honest, I would have to confess that too often, at least some of the time, I give mercy begrudgingly. I don't know about you. I said, I said, we tend to think about mercy as something we release in response to the merit of the person we're giving it to. Like, I give when I think you deserve it. Mm. When the biblical call is that we give the way God gives mercy. So this is not, this is not a new thing. God's, this, it's not like God made up this expectation yesterday. Uh, we're talking 700 BC here. Uh, he's like, people of mine. I have loved you. Uh, you need to love me in return, and it needs to be evident among you that you are a people loving one another. Uh, it was true in the parables that Jesus told, love your neighbor as yourself. It was true in the early church uh, as they began to form community, and we just read a few chapters up into the book of Acts, and they're caring for what is orphans, and they're, they're the heart that God has it is the heart uh, that, that becomes a part of his people. When, when things are working right. When, when, when things are going as, as we're supposed to be. We're attending to the things that, that are God's expectations. It was true 100 years ago. This is a scholar named Benjamin Warfield. Uh, he wrote this. Uh, so so give, like God gives, listen to Warfield writes. Now dear Christians, some of you pray night and day in the branches of the true vine. You pray to be made all over in the image of Christ. If so, you must be like him in giving. Though he was rich, yet for our sakes he became poor. Objection one. My money is my own. Now he's using finances here, but the principle he's talking about applies to everything. So, apply to finances, but it applies to everything. So, objection one. My money is my own. Answer. Christ might have said, my blood is my own, my life is my own, then where should we have been? Objection two. The poor are undeserving. Answer. Christ might have said, they are wicked rebels. Shall I lay down my life for these? I will give to the good angels. But no, he left the 99 and came after the lost. He gave his blood for the undeserving. Objection <coughs> three, the poor may abuse it. Answer, Christ might have said the same. Yea, with far greater truth, Christ knew that thousands would trample his blood under their feet, that most would despise it, that many would make it an excuse for sinning more, yet he gave his own blood. Oh, my dear Christians, if you would be like Christ, give much, give often, give freely to the vile and poor, the thankless and the undeserving. Christ is glorious and happy, and so will you be. It's not your money I want, but your happiness. Remember his own word, it is more blessed to give than to receive. And mercy gets very personal, is it not? <coughs> Will I give like Christ gives to me? 
knowing that I am undeserving. <laughs> Therefore, giving me, regardless of perceived merit. Justice is out there, but mercy, mercy is mercy is in here. Justice primarily applies uh, to those who are far better off. I mean, we mean that. Uh, mercy needs to first be applied to those I'm closest with. It can be tough, right? And am I characterized as merciful or as intolerant? Maybe you're married to the person that you're struggling most with. Maybe it's your boss. Maybe it's an employee. Maybe it's a neighbor, a sibling, a parent. But when we're struggling to give mercy, it's often a sign that we've lost perspective. So something has become kind of glaring and we really can't see anything else but it. All we can see is this grievous behavior, this person that was... So, so, so ask, here are four questions that you, you can ask yourself to help move beyond, move to a place where you can give mercy generously. Uh, four questions. Number one, what did I used to love about this person? What, what was it that I could respect about them? What was it that I, that, I, that I appreciated about this person? You, you might need to make a list. You might need to refer to it multiple times. Second question, why have I taken offense? Uh, what was the specific thing? Mannerism, language, attitude, behavior. Why have I taken offense? Here's a third question, this is a sobering question. Am I sinning against this person by standing over them in judgment? Of course you know, there's only one true judge, and that's not you, right? Uh, Here's a fourth question. What can I celebrate about this person? I mean, maybe it's going back to some of those things that you first love, that you first appreciate, that you could first acknowledge. But, but it's, it's beginning to kind of put the, the, the aggravating things into a broader context of, of, of things that I can affirm, things that I can focus on. And, and, and now I'm beginning to be able to bring mercy into some of these intimate relationships. Maybe you need some help with that. If you need to see a counselor, um, we'll have the full cost of your first visit of someone, a Christian counselor, that we can endorse you to. Um, and if you need help after that, um, we will we'll cover, uh, I mean, often we've covered half of the cost. You know, you're invested, we're invested. We just want, we just want help. Um, that's your church family saying, look, if there's a sticking point here, get some help in this. You see, the children of Israel had come home. They, they were at home with the Father. Here we are, we've tied in this Welcome Home series. We're talking about the joy of having come together. We've so many expectations that have been fulfilled, long held dreams that have been realized. Um, I, I've said to people, I think for most of us, we, we've come into the space at least and, and, and said, man, it kind of exceeds our expectations. That's a beautiful place to be, physically. And then we come relationally and we say, okay, and, and, and how can we bring together the expectations that we have? Well, well, let's begin. Let's begin by talking about God's expectations of us. And when I need to receive correction, may my heart be open and able to confess, repent, change, and receive forgiveness. It's one of the reasons why I'm thrilled that we come to the table again this morning. Because it's this reminder not to take mercy for granted. It's a reminder that I need to receive mercy and therefore need to give mercy. We refer to this as the Lord's table. It's such an intimate description. Like It's like the family Table. You invite someone around your family table for, for a meal? That, that's, a, that, that's personal. I want to invite the worship team to come and join me. And, and I'm going to lead us in prayer in just a moment. And, and prepare us to receive the Lord's table uh, together uh, this morning. In a moment, not quite yet, I'll invite us to stand. And if you'd like to receive communion, uh, 
I'm going to invite you to move to the south of your section, go either to the back or to the front. We're, we're going to pursue Jesus this morning. We're going to come and, and get. Uh, so move to the south of your section, come down and go back, and then return via the north of your section. Take your, your bread and cup into your seat if you would, please. Um, I, I think we can avoid most of the chaos, but if we end up with chaos again, uh, it's just a metaphor for life. You know, we're pursuing Jesus in the midst of it. Thank you so much for your patience in this. But, but, but let me bring us back to our point. I needed that instruction. But let me bring us back to, to our point. Uh, our servers, if you want to come and get ready. Um, I, I want to invite you to pray. I want you to stand with us, if you would, please. Will we begin by coming? Lord, I come. I confess, standing here I find my rest. Without you. Without you, I fall apart. I fall apart. You're the one who knows my heart. You're the one who guides my heart. 